Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Eugene Shepard. I'm in the Department of Near Eastern Judaic Studies. Um, and I'm also Associate Director of the Tauber Institute for the Study of European Jewry. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Maham Ayaz, who will give us a presentation today before the Scholar Seminar uh, of the Schusterman Center. Um, Maham is a doctoral candidate in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies here at Brandeis and a Schusterman Fellow. Uh, she's currently writing her dissertation on legal history of Israel from 1992 to 2013. Um, and today's presentation will actually focus on one slice of that uh, larger project. Uh, her research stems from her interest in comparative citizenship, boundaries of membership in nation states, and courts as political institutions. Uh, last semester, she taught a course called Defining Status in the Modern State. Um, and this semester, she's teaching a course at SUNY Albany um, called Zionism, Palestine, and Israel in Historical Perspective. Um, Maham received her bachelor, bachelor's in international studies from the University of Chicago, where she wrote her thesis on citizenship law in Bangladesh. Uh, she has previously worked at the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights and at the American Bar Foundation. Uh, today, Maham will be exploring a, a fascinating area uh, that deals with the intersection of legal history um, and political theory when it, when it comes to looking at the state of Israel and a question of what basic rights uh, may be. Uh, the title of her presentation is Land, Nation, and Individual Rights in Israel After Basic Law, Human Dignity. Uh, so we're let me just uh, say that Maham will give her presentation and then we'll open things up for a question and answer period that I'll moderate based on what I see in the, ch in the chat. Um, so um, without further delay, uh, I'll just say that uh, you have the option to follow with live captions that you can um, enable on your own individual browser. Uh, and I should also mention that this program will be recorded to cloud so that uh, we'll be able to see it uh, in the future should you want to access it then. Okay, Maha, please introduce yourself uh, and uh, tell us what you plan to present on. Thank you, Professor Shepard, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to the Schusterman Center for having me here. Um, as a Schusterman scholar um, and fellow, I have attended several of these lectures and I've had the pleasure of um, hearing speakers who have been influential for my own work. So it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, so I'll start by sharing my screen. Right, so um, today I'm presenting on um, land, nation, individual rights in Israel um, from 92 to 2013. To put this in context of what I do in general, how I got here, I didn't start off with an interest specifically in land. Um, actually, sorry. Yeah, uh, specifically in land, but I am interested more in contemporary nation states in general um, specifically nation states at the turn of the millennium and how they balance their commitment to national interests like national self-definitions and this you know globally accepted norm for universal individual equal rights. Um, there's of course the the rhetoric of balancing our own heritage, our own traditions and having equality um, for every citizen, but what does that look like on the ground? Um, my way of approaching this question is to look at court cases, um, specifically in, in Israel's case at Supreme Court cases during this time period, because I feel like they allow for, in relative terms, they allow for less room for double speak, right? Like you may, you know, a politician or an activist may have the rhetoric of 
you know, we are going to balance both these things equally, they're equally meaningful to us. Um, equal rights are part of our Jewish tradition and heritage, but at the end of the day, the court needs to decide, can I live here or can I not live here? Like one thing must be chosen um, between those two. So there's less room for, for the duality to exist um, um, in court cases. Um, court cases also serve as an easier access pathway for individuals to voice their grievances in the public, right? Uh, they become kind of this backdoor process when, especially, um, you know, within legal thought, um, especially when the legislature struggles um, to deal with contentious topics, when there are not um, you know, putting their foot forward in deciding contentious things, uh, the court can step up to, to fill some of those gaps. So uh, it becomes an easier pathway for individuals to approach the state. Um, my topic covers legal history from 92 to 2013. I look at Supreme Court cases that cite the basic law for human dignity, which, which is introduced in um, 1992. Um, to see how the how these individuals, both you know, national citizens, non-national citizens, how do they utilize this basic law in approaching the state? What are common topics? What are themes that come up? Um, and I notice land as one of the common and recurring topics that comes back um, in in these court cases. So that is the piece I will talk about today. There we are. So before we get into uh, the specific court cases that come up, I realized I needed to clarify this uh, conceptual, you know, connect the dot from property rights to ideological concepts of audits. Uh, there's of course a large body of literature on land and the nation, how um, concepts of the soil, of the motherland, fatherland, what have you, go into um, fundamental conceptions of what the nation is um, and how the nation sees itself. Um, specifically for Israel, um, of course, the, the purchasing of land, the establishment of settlements, um, the ideological value of Zion is part of Zionism from the very beginning. But more than just the strategizing and um, you know, the logistics of land, um, there is an emotional connection to it. Um, it's detailed, for example, in um, Boaz Newman's work, um, Land and Desire in Early Zionism, where he explains this almost like visceral need for people to work on the land, um, redeem it through labor, to walk the land, to, to name it, to make it their own. Um, there's definitely something beyond just the logistics, beyond just property that makes it part of what the nation is. Um, Omar Barto's new, um, Omar Barto from uh, Brown, his new edited volume uh, brings this concept into a conversation with the Israel-Palestinian conflict uh, by explaining you know, how both sides look at land at the same time. Um, whether that has to do with education, uh, again, demographics, theology, and so on. So in, in all these different fields, it's a well-established idea that land is, is a part of the nation, especially when it comes to Israel and Zionism. So when I look at the court cases, Supreme Court cases from 92 to 2013, and I focus in on land, the, the cases I'm actually seeing are property rights, real estate, inheritance, maybe construction, road work, and so on. It's compared to the grandeur of land, it's kind of boring, right? It's very mundane, it's this worldly. Um, it's not the sacred whole, um, as, as Haaretz is conceptualized, it's bits and pieces. Um, you know, it's very technical, like why is your garden wall two feet 
into my land, I'm going to take you to court. There's bickering in court cases. That is an actual case that made it to the Supreme Court. What does that garden wall tell us about the nation or the relationship between land um, and the nation? Well, not much on its own, right? But when you take 30 of those cases, 30 instances of people going to all the way to the Supreme Court, citing the basic law of human dignity, claiming some kind of individual rights violation and pushing back against the state, that's when you start to get a, a pattern. Um, that's when you start to see how the nation approaches the state in, in relation to the land. Um, and that's when you start to see certain underlying factors, which affects which kinds of cases are even brought to the court. So this is something I wasn't expecting when I went in to see, to look at the data. It's just like, you know, okay, um, the basic law protects individual rights. There will be some kind of pushback, but this, this dark contrast um, that appears when you look at what kind of cases are even brought to the court, um, that was wholly unexpected. And I will talk about that in a minute. So just to go over the basic law for human dignity and liberty um, passed in 1992 and what that adds to this conversation and why I choose that as my starting point. Um, so the first article was actually added in 94, but essentially I need to move the video to look at it. But essentially it says, um, Fundamental human rights in Israel are founded upon recognition of the value of the human being, the sanctity of human life, and the principles that all persons are free, etc. cetera. Um, the original first article, which now got bumped to 1A um, in 94, um, the original article said, the purpose of this basic law is to protect human dignity and liberty in order to establish in a basic law, the values of the state of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. So what does this add? How does this change the landscape? Of course, you know, it's not like Israel didn't have protections for individual rights before this time. They're, you know, um, mentioned as early as the Declaration of Independence. It's, it's the core part of the state, um, but also it doesn't quite undo the nationalist nature of the state. In fact, it reinforces it in the same breath as it protects the individual rights. So what does it add? I choose this as a starting point because it's uh, the basic law ends up serving as an effective tool that the individual can wield to approach the state, right? Um, and I want to see how this tool is being utilized in the first decade or so of its usage, first two decades of its usage, um, being part of the basic law allows people to use it, not just for themselves, but to push back against administrative decisions, against government decisions um, in a more systemic way than they could before. Um, and what I learned by looking at these court cases is that they're utilized very differently by members of what I call members of the nation versus member not members of the nation, right? Um, by by utilized differently, I don't mean to say that the Supreme Court itself is somehow being unfair or is interpreting it differently for different groups. No, it it affects what kind of cases are even brought to the Supreme Court, what kind of cases they're being asked to deliberate on. Um, and from there, of course, you get different interpretations of the law based on the questions being asked, right? Um, so this link between land and the nation land and the nation state, as we talked about, that is part of the foundation of the country. Um, it's part of the pioneering spirit uh, beyond just what is written in the law. Um, it necessitates 
that when the non-nationals um, asked for property rights, citing the basic law of human dignity, taking the case as far as the Supreme Court and pushing back usually against some kind of administrative or systemic decision, they are forced to engage with that relationship. The nation, on the other hand, doesn't quite have to do that. They don't have anything to prove. They approach the, uh, the state, they approach the Supreme Court in terms of land and individual rights wholly differently. Um, they ask for better rights. Um, they negotiate with the state. So one example of the types of cases that I see recurring um, in this data set is uh, cases having to do with expropriation. So um, to give you an, um, an idea of the scale, if I sort it down with all my filters and I look at just real estate cases, and of course land is more than real estate and I include those as well, but in just real estate cases, eight out of the 12 cases have to do with expropriation. Um, one of them is an appeal, but you know, seven out of 11 have to do with expropriation. And for all these cases, the state legally expropriated the land, compensated the people, and they came back to the court anyway to ask for better compensation. So they're not asking for rights or benefits as a baseline, they're asking for better rights and benefits. Um, what they have gotten is not enough. Um, they're able to approach the state as equals, sitting at the same um, negotiation table and able to say, no, my land, the, the amount of compensation I got doesn't, isn't sufficient for the land I gave or um, the public purpose for which my land was expropriated is now ended. Therefore, I'm asking for it back or I need to be compensated more because it's, it was, expropriated unduly, like the purpose for it has ended. Or they're questioning whether preemptive expropriation is allowed because um, the plans are underway, but it's not quite ready yet. Um, there's, even, there's even cases of, well, my land got expropriated 10, 15 years ago, and it's still not used. Um, should I get it back? And the answer for those are even, you know, no, the government can keep it because they intend to use it, but we will compensate you for the suffering, um, for the emotional harm of having taken your land. So the citizens in this case um, are usually um, Jewish nationals of the state. They're approaching the Supreme Court um, as equals, they're pushing back for their rights, they're negotiating for better. Um, on the other hand, non-nationals have fewer cases, uh, you know, much fewer, which makes sense. They, they make up a much smaller percentage of the state, so it's proportionate. But those cases are so much more popular. They are, um, you know, generally well known, they're written about it in international press, like international NGOs get involved, um, you know, local rights organizations get involved and so on, um, because, because they're being proposed by the non-nationals, they end up having to engage with this relationship between the nation and the land, right? They are not pushing back on, well, I can live here, but I want more they're saying, can I live here? Um, these, these are the cases that cross that line from property rights to harlots. These are the ones that have to engage with the values and boundaries, um, conceptual and literal boundaries of the relationship between nation and land. Um, so one of the cases that's um, possibly the most well-known one here um, is the Kadan case um, where the Kadan family, which is an Arab family 
pushed back um, against not being allowed to live in the Katsir settlement. So the Katsir settlement um, was built under the aegis of the JNF, which got its lands from the in Israel Lands Administration. So there's this chain of command that leads back to the state, right? Um, the cases eventually decided in their favor that yes, um, they should be allowed to live where they live. But what is interesting here for our purposes is that even as the petitioners are saying, okay, this is blatant discrimination, they're simply saying that by virtue of us not being Jews, we aren't allowed to live here. They go through pains to explain that they're not challenging the nation, that they're not challenging the settlement project, um, that they are not looking to undo the history of the of the settlement project. They recognize the roots of the country and so on and so forth. And they, they repeatedly ask for a forward-looking decision that this is, yes, we have gotten where we are right now, but in the future, we can do something else that, um, you know, the settlement project as it existed need not be the same uh, going ahead. The pushback from the um, Katsir settlement and from the JNF together is exactly as they predicted, right? Like this, this will mean the end to the settlements. This is not just a decision in, um, in isolation. Um, and we need to have that bigger picture in mind um, in order to make the decision. The court still decides in their favor, but similarly, they, they go back to what the petitioners claimed and say, no, um, we are deciding it in this case for this settlement for these people, but that doesn't mean that this is the bigger picture all around. Um, it simply means that Katsir is not specific enough in what they're, in their requirements, um, in what they expect from people applying there. Um, for a different, more specific settlement, things might be different. So this led actually to administrative changes, um, decisions that affected how the JNF uses um, the land that is allotted to them. Now they have to accept a petition from an Arab family wanting to live in a Jewish settlement, but the JNF gets compensated from the Israel Land Administration um, for the land that they um, so decide. So again, these cases, and then there is, you know, the Lands Council re representation case, there is Silvan, which has to do with East Jerusalem um, and the Israel Antiquities um, Administration. Those cases step beyond, you know, property rights of the individual person living in the land. Um, and go into the realm of, well, what do we want from the nation? What does, what is the relationship here? Um, um, sorry. Um, what do we want the future to look like? Not so much necessarily how settlements have been in the past. So overall, um, the basic law, human dignity, when it comes to land, nation, individual rights, creates room um, and a lot of opportunity for pushback against blatant discrimination, um, against need for better representation in lands council. Um, it serves as a tool for the individual um, to approach the state and claim um, better rights, but there is an underlying con uh, context. There is kind of an unspoken story here about um, who, who is even approaching the state and how are they approaching it? Which cases become popular and why? Um, the expropriation cases outnumber anything else, but they're not the ones that make the news because they're so mundane, but they explain the relationship that the nation has. They're able to approach uh, the state in more um, equal terms and push back against it. So I'm going to pause there um, because I didn't want to get into all of the specific cases here. I 
but if anyone has questions about them, I am here to answer them. So thank you. Thank you, Maham. I was wondering, uh, before I get to some of the questions in the chat, if you could provide some of the um, contours, the political juridical contours, uh, as to why you're looking at this period in particular of 92 through 2013. Um, and within that context, can you give us a larger sense of what it means for Israel, the state of Israel that claims to be a constitutional democracy and has an uncodified constitution? Um, it's not unique mm -hmm. in that sense, but there are only about a half dozen countries in the world that share that status. Uh, so if you can kind of bring us from, say, May right. of 48 um, <laughs> through 58, and then again to uh, maybe 88 and 92. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think also what, what what's on people's minds is what happened after 2013? Why are you stopping right. in 2013? Right. Um, so I chose 1992 as the starting point um, because of the introduction of the basic law of human dignity. So how that is unique is that before this time, um, Israel does not have a constitution. It has a set of basic laws. Um, and traditionally, the purpose of a basic law is um, to define the contours of the state, like in very functional ways, like this is what the government does. This is how um, elections are to be held and so on, um, but not so much the ideological aspects which are more a part of the constitution when it is fleshed out. So with Israel, there was always initially the expectation that there will be a constitution one day, um, but instead they have simply kept adding um, to the basic law. 92 is interesting to me because this is definitely stepping outside the realm of the kind of the logistical needs that are served by a basic law into more ideological ideas of what the state wants to be, um, how the state defines itself, right? It is, at the time, it is taken as a constitutional revolution by a lot of people, namely um, the Chief Justice, Aaron Barak. Um, it is taken as a sign that this now, now that it has these ideological foundational things, it serves as a document that can be used for judicial review. Um, and is, you know, the, the court had judicial review when it came to administrative decisions, but now it is judicial review over other laws that this can be used to overturn um, unconstitutional decisions. Again, there is no constitution, but this is serving in that, um, in that capacity. Um, it is also interesting because putting, you know, um, individual universal rights like human dignity and liberty is pretty vague. Putting that um, as part of a constitutional document for a nation state can allow for a lot of pushback if people are to take that tool and kind of run with it, right? Um, it now means the individual can stand their ground um, against national, national ideals, against national rulings, um, and have a constitutional law behind them to support them. So that was my starting point. Um, I stopped in 2013 um, because at this point we have um, workable drafts of the 2018 nation state law that are um, already being debated in court. And um, I thought making it too recent was a little um, tricky for my purpose because, you know, the court cases take years and years to be decided. So I'm not sure I could say that I'm offering a um, legal history up to 2020 when the cases that were uh, brought to the court in 2020 haven't been decided yet, right? So in by 2013, I can say, yes, I, I've covered the ground that I claim to cover. And the introduction of the nation state law, once again, like changes the realm because now you have the same kind of ideological tool that can be used by the nations and, and communal groups to push back in the same way. 
Wonderful. Um, okay, so let me uh, give you some questions that come up in the chat. Um, so uh, one person asks um, if um, there are differences in non-member categories of Palestinian Israeli citizens versus Palestinian Jerusalemites, uh, for example. Yes, there are. I mean, of course there are. Um, in For the cases that I have seen during this time, you might have noticed I mentioned Silwan as one of the cases, which is um, a neighborhood in East Jerusalem where um, you have both a Palestinian population living locally and the city of David. So the pushback is from the residents of the area saying that this excavation projects impinges on our property rights, right? Um, the case in itself is fairly straightforward to decide because they're claiming property damage and there is not enough evidence of property damage. Um, but again, the unspoken story, the underlying narrative is that land is not just property rights, land is history, land, land is narrative. Um, in their case, the, their, uh, you know, their stance is weakened by the fact that they were under different sovereign um, realms, legal realms over time. So the Israel Antiquities Administration says, well, the land was declared a national park back in 1944. The state didn't exist in 1944. Um, the land, the particular land you're talking about went through British control, then went through Jordanian control and is now under Israeli control. And somehow we kind of skip all that history to say the land was declared a national park. Therefore, we have every right to work here. Um, and, and so this the rhetoric of the nation as whole as complete kind of crosses the line from just being wordplay to now being legal reality. Um, it's like those middle years didn't happen. Um, yeah, and, and the status of the particular houses is also under question because they're unregistered um, and so on. So there is a big difference in what happens in East Jerusalem. Um, I'm not going into West Bank. That is a different legal realm <laughs> entirely. Um, but that is very different than the Kadan case where people are, the, the Arab citizens are able to say, look, we are law abiding citizens. Like here, you know, um, we just want to live here. We are, it, it's almost like a assimilation, you know, narrative of, um, you know, we are um, honorable law abiding and there is no reason we shouldn't be allowed to be here. Um, so, uh, Professor Mersky uh, asked um, uh, about the uh, distinction that's out there in the literature between ethnic and civic nationalism. Um, do you see your work as kind of complicating the, this dichotomy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it. I didn't go in again. I didn't go into this looking for you know what is the difference between how the nation versus non-national. It's just what the data showed me, right? Like it, you look at twelve cases and ten of them are just complaining about not getting enough money for their land, right? And it's very different than the cases that come to mind that become very popular. Um, there is, of course, like it's a you know, complicated literature on ethnocracy. Um, Orn Yiftachil writes a lot about um, land and ethnocracy. I didn't even get into the Bedouin cases, which happened a little after my time period, but he writes about them. Um, and I, I'm not sure it covers um, what is happening in these ca uh, court cases, right? Like the laws aren't being applied differently for different people. They, it's just their interests are different when they engage with the land. Um, it's not, it's not kind of a top down um, process of which cases come to the court or not. It's just, this is what the lived experience is and that's why they approach the court with different ground. Mm 
Okay, and and John Levison is curious to know if if you've seen pattern. You've mentioned patterns in terms of how the uh, plaintiffs um, uh, try to make their case, uh, 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 given these configurations of of, of basic laws. Um, uh, do you see patterns in terms of how the court rules um, on these different contested issues? Um, by necessity, yes. Um, it's not like they are, um, you know, adding to the law or taking away from it in substantial ways. But by necessity, they are asked to to deal differently uh, with things. For example. Um, with the um, with the Silwan case again, um, ultimately it comes down to is there property damage or is there not property damage? But in the course of getting there, we talk about well, how far do property rights extend below ground versus above ground, or um, what is the value, comparative value of one person's property rights versus um, how the nation is served by the city of David or, you know, um, an antiquity site that is very much related to the nation itself, its own history, it upholds it in concrete terms, right? Those questions come up even though they don't have to do with the case itself, right? Ultimately, you could just decide the case by saying, we don't see enough evidence of property rights, uh, of property damage, I'm sorry. Um, but a large part of the case itself talks about, well, you know, this excavation is very important and we are going to keep doing it. Um, so it, it's not that, it's not that something is being added when they deal with expropriation cases brought by uh, Jewish nationals. It's just, they don't need to go into kind of con grand concepts of principle and, you know, relationship of, with land and so on. And uh, there are a few people that are asking, and this goes uh, beyond the scope uh, um, in terms of time period, but they want to get to more contemporary issues. If your study leads you to recognize anything familiar or unfamiliar in either cases, like what's uh, in terms of Sheikh Jarrah or um, uh, Shana Weiss asks, uh, what about um, uh, kind of contested uh, places like uh, Givat uh, Amal Bet in Tel Aviv, um, mm -hmm. which deals with like, member J Jewish members, uh, um, mm -hmm. Mizrahim. Um, uh, and there's also another question from Shane of, of whether uh, you find any of this attempt to relate between nation and land according to these basic laws um, with Ukrainian refugees uh, that uh, mm. uh, have or are perhaps in process uh, right. of immigration. I, uh, I'm reminded Quite a lot. of, I know. right, <laughs> I'm reminded of kind of Renan's description of the nation as uh, requiring a lot of forgetting, um, right? You're choosing, um, to remember some certain components of what you are and you're intentionally forgetting certain other bits of history. As with Silvan, you're forgetting a lot of history when you say that this land was declared a national park in 44. You're pretending the British didn't happen or the, the Jordanian um, rule didn't happen, um, but you're choosing to remember, you know, kind of traditional relationships with the land um, that may not be legal um, on the ground, that may, don't have documentation in the same way, uh, but have meaning for different communities. And both, you know, both communities do this to a certain extent. And it, it becomes a question of values uh, about, you know, whose memory or whose narrative has more to say than, um, the legal document here. Um, I, I don't think I could comment too much on Sheikh Jarrah because it's so recent, um, but it's also the same story at the same, you know, it, it's, the, it's a repetition of the same kind of patterns. 
um, when you have to prove kind of legality of certain things in court, the state is going to end up having more power because they're the ones who decide what is legal and what is not. Um, they hold all the cards when it comes to documentation, um, what is approved in court, what is not approved in court and so on. And when you have a change of administrations um, of sovereign realms over time, things are going to get messy um, by necessity. And, and speaking of messiness, uh, when we compare American notions of eminent domain mm -hmm. um, to these questions of land rights and property rights, um, it, how, how do you see them translating or not translating um, into the Israeli context? Could you explain that a bit more? I'm not super it, it, so familiar. It, it, I, I, so this is from Mitchell Cohen. I, I, okay. I assume um, in terms of uh, the state's right to declare eminent domain over any piece of private property mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that relates to a public or state, uh, uh, strong state interest, they can override private uh, property rights. Right. Um, do you see that translating into your cases that you're looking at? Right. I I don't know the U.S. laws on it uh, actually, but Israel has a strong, um, you know, the expropriation is very, and I wouldn't say easy, but like legally, it's a strong case for the state to make. Um, they even go so far in a couple of uh, cases to say, well the land was leased by us in the first place. And, you know, it's not like you own it. Um, the state owns all the land um, effectively, right? So when Israel says we're expropriating the land, half the time they're saying we're canceling your lease um, and we're gonna compensate you for it. But it that is a, an argument they're able to make in court that, even if we're taking the land, say preemptively, um, it is an urgent need and we are going to um, continue this. Um, or in some cases, you know, workers like a, a kibbutz brought up a claim that they have been working this land for this many years, that must mean that they own it. And the state says, well, no, like even if it's a long-term lease, you don't, at the end of the lease, you don't own the land. Um, I would think that that is very different than the American context, but e even if there is um, room for expropriation in the U.S., it uh, it's you know doesn't compare with what Israel um, can do. Um, and one of your fellow dissertators uh, wants you to step back and say, you know, no. Um, what, what, what is your real contribution uh, to the understanding of, of legal history in, um, in these cases that you're looking at? Um, I was surprised. Um, I, I think when we think about this time period and we think of um, land and individual rights, like if you know the area, you would think of Kadan you would think of Silwan, right? Like those are the popular cases that come to mind because those are the ones that engage with, you know, this line between um, nation and land that we're talking about. But that's not the majority of the cases. The majority of the cases are mundane complaints by the nationals asking for better rights. Um, the basic law is an important tool um, that creates a lot of opportunities for um, the non-nationals to push back against discrimination. But it's also a well-utilized tool by the nationals to simply argue for even better rights, right? The distinction here is that one side is asking for um, kind of, can I live here? Whereas the other side is asking for, I should get better than what I have been offered, right? Um, can, can, can you give us a, can you give us a um, one or two examples of how that kind of asymmetry is working in terms of how the 
these in the cases you're looking at how the national claims to land and mm -hmm. property rights um it tries to expand um and make ro more robust uh their claims to uh uh areas um in the, in the cases that you're looking at right I, I they're pretty blatant i mean they're just like oh yeah my land got expropriated i got this much money but i think i deserve more it's very cut and dry or um my land got expropriated, but it hasn't been used in 10 years. So really I should get it back. And, and the court might agree with them actually and say, sure, yes, correct. Or if the government agency has an intention to use it, the court might say, we're going to keep the land, but we recognize that you have suffered and therefore you will be compensated more. Or we recognize and therefore you'll be compensated the state will be required to cover cover legal fees and so on. Um, they, I mean, it, it's clearly about benefits um, from the state. Um, we can even go into like war damages cases having to do with land. Like is my property or my business, can I argue for it to be included in this part of the Galilee that got compensated uh, when businesses were affected by the war, you know, and whether or not the state agrees with it, there's like a certain chutzpah to like approaching the state to say, no, not this isn't enough. I want more. Um, and that's not to say they shouldn't do it. I just mean that's very different than what the non-nationals would argue for. They're simply saying, can I get proportionate representation or can I um, live here? Um, and, you know, so on. Um, I, I'd also wonder um, to what degree, I mean, are, are these individual cases tracked in um, scholarship on Israeli legal history? Um, to what degree, what kind of sources are you looking at mm -hmm. either primary or and secondary that track these individual cases? Do you want to try to give the sense of, uh, to those in, in the seminar? Um, to, what, to what degree are you uh, kind of looking at these, ag these cases in aggregate? Um, right. which might be known to legal scholars, mm -hmm. um, but only handled on an individual basis? Uh, or to what degree are you, you know, breaking new ground uh, by um, looking specifically at cases involving land? So for, for example, mm -hmm. um, if, if one were interested uh, in just tracking these 30 cases that you mentioned, Mm -hmm. um, how did how did you find these thirty cases? Were you yeah. able to find uh, you know articles in law journals or uh, mm -hmm. historical journals that deal with the same thirty cases, or or did you have to be a little bit more industrious? I yeah, I had to be creative and um, use my judgment as a scholar. Uh, basically, I. Uh, looked at Supreme Court cases from this time period that have to do with individual rights and engage with um, constitutional law. So they're pushing back in some way on uh, my rights are violated, not as you know individual to individual, but in like a systemic way or through an administrative decision and so on. Of those cases, um, I mean, I, I read through a lot of the most cited ones. So they are cited by other court cases. Um, and you know, some of the cases I mentioned actually don't turn up under real estate. They turn up as, you know, they're just written about more. Um, Silwan is one of them. It doesn't show up under real estate cases. So look at all of the ones that are um, most cited by other scholars and so on. And Additionally, um, look at these subcategories that you could have within law, like property rights, real estate, construction plan, so on, inheritance even, um, to see what are all of those cases. Then you put them together and you just you know qualitatively look at it and see what are the patterns here. Um, there was a first part to this question. 
I, I think I think you implicitly answered it that okay. um, that there really aren't kind of these set categories. Yeah. That so that's part yeah. of what you know, part of what I think is interesting, right? Like um, the cases that are talked about more again are the the ones in you know having to do with the non-nationals, um, not necessarily cited by other court cases, but written about um, in, in secondary literature. And that's part of what's interesting about them. Like the Silwan case on the ground, the reasoning is relatively straightforward, but it's the big deal. Uh, you know, international agencies get involved, people write reviews of, you know, the history and the, the meaning of the, so on. Um, there's a lot of secondary literature on that. But when you put it in context of the other ones, it's one case and it's, you know, it doesn't come up again in other cases because it's so specific. Um, and, and can you give us a sense, um, are there other kind of categories of cases that you're interested in exploring your dissertation beyond questions of real estate, land, property? <laughs> Right, so my first chapter is land, and then the next is family, um, and then probably security and short addendum on religion um, later. Family is really interesting because, um, you know, given um, the religious courts and their control over uh, personal status law, a lot of family related cases end up in religious courts. So people usually, but approach the state for um, where citizenship itself is in question or what a family is in civic terms is under question. Um, so that definition, uh, it, you know, by nece uh, necessity, the state has its own definition of what a family is or um, how we value families as a state. That is different than what, um, is used in the in the religious courts. Um, Have you changed any of your um, earlier um, conceptions that came out of your background in uh, political theory and international relations with kind of basic um, notions of what rights are um, in theoretical mm -hmm. abstract terms versus what they are in on the ground practice and in the juridical articulation uh, by a court um, as to what rights there are and aren't? Hmm. I, I would say I, I'm not sure I came in with a very defined conception of what rights are. I think that is the question. Um, it, Initially, when I looked at this question, I thought it would end up being some form of, um, you know, do individual rights end up undermining communal rights? Um, that was one of the questions I was thinking of, but not necessarily, actually. Um, there is a push for, um, you know, group representation that still uses the basic law of human dignity, but you know, claims rights not as, um, you know, a, a faceless citizen of Israel without any demographic specifications. No, like people a lot of times approach the state, approach the courts as I'm a member of this community and therefore, um, you know, this is my right that is being violated or um, this is something I deserve or, you um, Kind of what what Israeli courts like to call um, positive discrimination or affirmative action, as we would call it, um, that it, groupness is still a part of these court cases, which I wouldn't necessarily expect without looking at them. So it, it so it seems that all of these rights then really do stem from more corporate, communal, national conceptions. Yes, yes. Even though they might be prefaced in universal terms. Of, right, uh, right. Basic laws of human dignity and liberty. Right. Uh, okay, wonderful. Well, 
Maham, I thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm thank sure you. everyone that listened is can't wait to see the dissertation <laughs> completed and then published as a book. Um, I did want to tell uh, everyone that is out there that the next Schusterman Scholar Seminar is uh, Jewish masculinity in the Zionist ballroom. And that uh, will be on April 28th uh, with Sonia Galantz. Um, so on behalf of my colleagues at the Schusterman Institute, I, I thank you all for joining us in this wonderful presentation. Thank you.